With that, I'd like to introduce Kurt Mead. He's a naturalist up at Tedegooch State Park, one of our fabulous North Shore State Parks. And he's going to tell us everything about wild edibles up there. So I think with that, Kurt, I will hand it over to you. I'm going to back up and say I'm not going to tell you everything about wild edibles because I don't know everything about wild edibles. I I often imagine um, people before stores, before agriculture, before uh, in this area, let's say European colonization, um, how do they make it through a year? Um, a year's worth of food. If you think about how much food a person eats, it's a it, in a year, it's a massive amount. If you were to pile one person's food intake in the middle of a gymnasium floor, it would be an amazing pile. And so, how how do you how do you forage? How do you gather enough to keep you and your family alive? And that's where, as a modern, um, I'll just say European American, I, I I don't really know how they accomplished all that. That was pretty amazing to me. Um, but I do enjoy foraging. I do enjoy using wild fruits and other products um, to supplement my diet and to um, and to just enrich my life. Uh, I just see and experience lots of neat things uh, when I'm out doing these things. I learn a lot. I'm someone who likes to learn everywhere I go, and I learn a lot through this. So we're going to just do um, the Reader's Digest condensed version of Wild Edibles of the North Shore. So you got to be thinking about um, what season you're in. There are things that are that are edible and and available to forage in the springtime. Stuff in the summer, fall, winter. Uh, um, you're not going to harvest wild rice right now because it's not ripe yet. So seasons are very important when it comes to, to foraging and wild edibles. <clears throat> We're going to start with the obvious one, and that's berries. Um, I don't know anyone who doesn't like just hiking along a trail and just grazing as they go. Um, rice, raspberries are one of our um, um, oh, pre, probably premium um, in terms of volume and, and flavor. Uh, wild edibles up here on the North Shore. We've got them all over the state. <clears throat> uh, you can also use the leaves in a tea. The leaves need to be dried first. It, it uh, destroys some compound that'll give you a, um, gastrointestinal problems, but if you dry them out, I have, I have actually drunk quite a bit of raspberry leaf tea. It's it's quite good. Continue on to thimbleberries, and thimbleberries are something that if you haven't spent a lot of time in the North Shore, you may not have encountered them. They have very large, fuzzy maple leaf shaped leaves. They're a shrub, maybe waist high, a little bit higher, oftentimes along trails and woodland openings, and they produce this this fruit that is. Uh, it's in the raspberry family, looks like a raspberry, tastes like nothing you've ever tasted before. It's got a very interesting flavor. Most people really like them. Um, they're just unusual. Uh, they, they, uh, they do have kind of a muskiness to them that, that some people find offensive, but uh, most people really like them. Thimbleberries are a good one. We've got dewberries, which is another raspberry plant, um, raspberry family. They grow really low to the ground, maybe six inches from the ground. Um, I've been seeing them in bloom this week. Uh, they're blooming right now, and uh, berries will be coming shortly. Just a delightful, fresh, um, um, sweet tart berry uh, to add to your add to your palate. Of course, the the universal blueberries up here in the northeastern part of the state. Um, lots of lots of wild blueberries to be picked. Depends on the year. Some years the crop completely fails because of frost or weather in the spring, uh, but most most years there are blueberries to be found. Um, extremely helpful um, fruit uh, for human consumption and a lot of animals depend on it as well. Actually, a lot of timber wolves in the summertime um, will end up grazing on a lot of berries. Uh, my dog likes fruit, my dog likes carrots. Why shouldn't a wolf like the same thing? So you might be in competition with wolves and bears for your blueberries. Black currants. And their cousin, the red currant, um, both live in boggy, kind of wet areas. Um, very different flavored berries. The black currant is very pungent, kind of musky. The red currant um, is is tart and kind of vibrant. Both can be collected um, 
in numbers and processed into jams and jellies or dried as fruits, as dried currants, or uh, turned into syrups or that kind of thing. Choke cherries are an interesting one. <clears throat> a lot of um, I, my, some of my heritage is Scandinavian and uh, the Swedes, when they immigrated here, they had never met choke cherries before. And they had made great use out of them for making wine. Uh, a lot of a lot of old Swedish farmsteads had choke cherry wine on the, on the table quite often. <clears throat> makes great syrups, makes great jellies. They're interesting to just graze on to eat because they have there's some property about them that kind of turns the inside of your mouth fuzzy. It's not harmful. It's not bad. It's kind of interesting, um, uh, but they they taste pretty good. They have a big pit in the middle as well. The Juneberry is an interesting plant up here in the North Shore. There are, and I'm, I'm forgetting the number, it's somewhere, it's, I know it's a prime number, somewhere between seven and 11 different species of amelanchier, which is the genus name of this shrub um, that grow up on the North Shore. And some of them are really mealy and tasteless, and some of them are just really flavorful, and you can't tell just by looking at them. So <clears throat> you gotta walk around and sample a bunch of them. And when you find, uh, a stand of June berries that taste really good. Remember where they are, because you can come back year after year. Um, they're, they're, I describe their flavor as uh, if an apple and a blueberry had a baby, this is what would result. Um, June berries are um, uniquely flavored, uh, very tasty, make great jams and jellies. Um, I used to, when I was in college, I used to make a lot of June berry milkshakes. Um, um, they can be eaten fresh, they're, they're quite tasty. They go by lots of different names, service berry, Oregon blueberry, Saskatoon, Amelanchier. There are more names than that, but that's all I can fit on here. Highbush cranberry. <clears throat> there are two types of viburnum, which is the genus name for this, that grow in Northern Minnesota. One of them is the natural American highbush cranberry. And the other one was brought in, it's a European highbush cranberry that's brought, that grows as an ornamental. And the fruit from the European highbush cranberry is inedible. It's too bitter. It's got some compounds in it that might not make you feel very good. Um, but you can tell pretty quickly just by the taste um, that the highbush cranberry uh, is, is the right one. Lots of jellies, jams, um, um, syrups, that kind of stuff can be made from the highbush cranberry. It's a late fall, uh, you pick them kind of late fall around frost time. Um, so it's uh, rest of the berries are kind of midsummer. This is a nice one to take a little break from summer berry picking and then start picking in the fall. Bog cranberries are one of my favorites. Uh, you do have to get into a sphagnum bog. You've got to get into a really boggy area. Your feet are going to be wet. Uh, you'll want boots or just wading shoes. And after a good frost in the fall, you'll find these red cranberries. They're like the size of a very large pea, really flavorful, um, really important source of food for uh, people who lived here before um, Europeans arrived. And the mountain ash, I, I've actually never utilized it, but I do know that people do make food products out of mountain ash. Um, it's a uh, uh, very important food for lots of birds like cedar waxwings, things like that. It's a very attractive plant to have on your property. You can buy them and plant them. Um, but I've seen recipes for mountain ash wine and I've seen um, jellies as well, but I've never tried them. Rose hips, um, really, really important source of vitamin C for wintertime. They dry up really nicely um, and uh, uh, were often collected just for that helpful purpose. They didn't, I suppose, people back then didn't know what vitamin C was, but they knew that they did better if they ate rose hips. Um, and rose hips can be made into uh, tinctures and um, um, jellies and can be eaten kind of, they can be eaten raw as well. There is a, a cluster of seeds inside of a rose hip with these kind of hairy, um, thorns on them that aren't terribly palatable. So you kind of nibble a rind off the outside of them and they're, they're quite tasty. Now we get more into the greens area, um, the dreaded stinging nettle. Um, I grew up on a farm and 
I spent half my life battling stinging nettles. And now my wife has imported stinging nettles onto our property because of their food value. Uh, she's making soups, she's pickling the leaves, um, she's making, you can make nettle pesto. There's all sorts of things you can do with, especially young nettle growth. The younger the growth, the better. Springtime is a good time to be working with nettles. Dandelions, a European plant, but um, just ubiquitous uh, all, all over the place. Lots of different parts of the dandelion are edible. You can eat the flowers. Uh, there's a classic dandelion wine. Uh, the, the roots are um, uh, dried and pulverized and steeped uh, to make certain medicines. The leaves, when they're young, can be eaten um, just as like salad greens. They get bitter as they get older, but try young dandelion leaves. They're, they're very tasty. They're very lettuce-like. Purple violets, um, the flowers themselves, imagine serving a salad um, sprinkle the top with with um, purple violets uh, it's just a they're 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 flavorful they're gorgeous they're pretty kind of a fun thing to forage um, something something you can eat just kind of along the trail just nibble on them but not the yellow violet there's two different there's more than two different kinds of violets there's several different kinds of purple violets different species of them but the yellow violet is a different plant and um, related to the purple violets, but is not edible. So not the yellow violet, just the purple ones, purple, purple and white. The blue bead lily, um, also called Clintonia, um, the berries themselves are considered toxic. But I, I, think I, I think you'd have a hard time finding a child who grew up on the North Shore who didn't at least sample them once or twice thinking they were blueberries, my children included. But what is um, really useful about them is in the springtime, we're just a little bit past that point right now, as the as those that rosette of flowers is coming out of the ground, they are delicious. They taste like cucumbers on steroids. Um, they're just really, really rich, flavorful, nutritious, leaf to eat. Once once they start blooming and the berries start forming, the leaves get too bitter to eat, so you can't eat them. But it's a good springtime foraging option for you. Basswood leaves, um, when they're young, not fully mature, but when they're young, you can see these are just starting to grow, are very tasty as well. You can make a whole salad out of basswood leaves. Uh, something people don't think about very often, a tree leaf as a food, uh, but basswood leaves are are edible and tasty. Lamb's quarters um, is one we oftentimes find them around gardens and around construction sites and stuff like that. But lamb's quarters is reportedly more nutritious than spinach. Uh, it grows prolifically uh, when it does grow, um, say in your garden or something like that, and is um, uh, a green that we eat at our house quite often. Purslane is also very sort of, um, find them around human activity quite a bit in gardens, along sidewalks, in yards, things like that. Um, I spent years trying to remove it from my garden um, and now I've started eating it and it's really, really tasty. They're, they're kind of a, a tart uh, um, green leaf. You just eat the leaves, not the stems. Uh, they're very tasty, uh, and very abundant. Some other plants, uh, burdock, again, kind of like stinging nettle, a plant I grew up trying to eradicate on a farm I grew up on. Uh, the um, leaves and the young shoots, the young leaves and young shoots are, are edible and uh, the roots themselves um, can be used in various ways as foods and medicines. The daylily is not a native plant, but it is certainly naturalized in the area and you'll see ditches full of it. Um, this is one of the first wild edibles I ever ate. I was probably nine or 10 years old and I had um, a copy of, um, oh, I'm gonna blink on his name now, the, the foraging guy, Ewell Gibbons. Ewell Gibbons had a book on foraging uh, plants back in the day and I had a well-worn copy of that and the uh, unopened flower buds 
um, just picked right off the plant and then steamed uh, just like you would any other vegetable. Uh, it turns your water oddly purple, but then the the resulting, I consider it a vegetable coming off of it, is, is really, really tasty. Um, and you can pick quite a few of them off of a patch of day lilies grown in a ditch or in your yard or something like that. This is another spring one, the ostrich fiddlehead ferns. Now, not all ferns are edible. Not all fiddleheads are edible. There are some that will make you sick. The ostrich fern is a pretty safe one if you remember this. And that is if you look at that larger picture on the left, you can see that the, as the ferns coming up out of the ground, it's covered in kind of a, a papery, coppery looking uh, multi-layered um, sheets of kind of lubricant. Uh, the, that tender fiddlehead is pushing up through soil. It needs some protection as it comes up through soil. And as soon as it pops up, then that sort of peels off um, to some extent. Um, this one I describe as though asparagus and green beans had a baby. Um, they're one of my favorite vegetables. Um, they can get over harvested in, in more populated areas, so we got to kind of be careful with that. But they typically grow in, in floodplains. Um, they like that rich kind of floodplain soil uh, moisture. Uh, once, they, once they unfurl and grow up into full-size ferns, <clears throat> they're not edible anymore. But as a, as a fiddlehead, they're very tasty. And um, I've collected them and frozen them and we've eaten them all winter. Another spring one to pick is the, the wild leek. Some people call them ramps. Um, wild leeks propagate very slowly. So if you have a small, if you find a small patch of leeks, wild leeks, I would encourage you to leave them alone. But there are places I know of here in the North Shore where they grow, there's just acres of them underneath the brush, underneath the forest cover. Um, um, catching that early sunlight before the leaves come out. And uh, I used to harvest both the bulb and the top um, and use them to make leek pesto and for all sorts of cooking um, ideas, even just doing them raw. But just for sustainability purposes, I have gone to just um, harvesting the tops. The bulb stays down beneath the ground and will grow again next year. And so it's a more sustainable way of collecting leeks uh, instead of digging them up. And they're kind of a challenge to dig up because they have really tough root systems and they're tangled in with all the shrubs and tree roots and all that kind of stuff. So just get out there with a pair of scissors and just sort of snip them off, collect the leaves. And uh, there's lots of things you can do with them. They're very, very pungent, very tasty. Cocktails can be used in multiple different ways. Um, the, the root or tuber itself can be pulverized, rinsed in water. You get this um, starch heavy um, sort of uh, residue that comes off of that. And that can be dried and used kind of like a flour um, for baking. Uh, it can be used just as for starch or carbohydrates for your diet. The, uh, when the, the cattail flour in the picture there, you see the, the dark brown hot dog looking thing, that's the female part of the flower. The skinnier part on top is the male part of the flower and they are prodigious producers of pollen. They produce vast amounts of pollen, which if you catch it on just the right, get the right timing of it. Um, I've seen people carry a, like a paper lunch bag and just shake the top of the cattail um, head in the bag and the pollen all comes out and you can see the result there on the right, this beautiful yellow, um, super nutrient dense uh, additive to all sorts of things. Of course, maple syrup and maple sugar have been uh, utilized uh, for centuries in this area. Um, maple syrup was not a European thing, so it was definitely learned um, from the native people in North America how to use it. Uh, if you think of the Ojibwa, maybe 200 years ago, they did not have glass bottles. They did not have a way to store syrup. 
And so they would boil it down into uh, uh, a drier state in just sugar. And our modern brown sugar is really just sort of a, a fake maple sugar substitute. It's um, supposed to sort of supplement that. Uh, various ways of boiling it down. Um, you can see the picture on the upper right. There's a there's a log and the traditional pre cast iron stove way of doing it was to simply pick up hot rocks, drop them in the liquid. When they cooled down, you'd pull them out, put them back in the fire, put some more hot rocks in, and you boil it from the inside in a wooden log rather than boiling it from the outside with an iron kettle. There are a few nuts and seeds up along the North Shore here. The beaked hazel is our main hazelnut species up here. Um, if you look at the picture of the of the green husk over the fruit, you see all those little fine hairs. Those fine hairs are almost like fiberglass um, in the effect they have on your skin. So um, harvesting hazelnuts is best done with gloves on. Otherwise, you'd be picking those little things out of your fingers for days. Um, and then you've got all the hazelnuts. You got to crack them and eat them. But um, they're a hazelnut like no other. They're very good. Um, and the trick is to get them, they, about the minute they ripen, the squirrels and the chipmunks start getting at them. And so timing is very important on hazelnut picking as well. You got to get there before the, those larger rodents get to them. Bears like them too. <clears throat> Lots you can do with acorns. A lot of tannins and acorns are after they're shelled out. You boil the meats. Um, a couple of times to extract the tannins out of them. Then they can be dried and ground up, used kind of as a flour or a thickener or additive to a stew or something like that. Um, acorns are very, um, very nutritious. Uh, quite a bit of work goes into them, but um, if you need the food, you need the food. And then of course, wild rice, the main staple of the Ojibwa um, in this area, even to this day, uh, I have wild rice before. It is hard work. Uh, it is long, tedious work, and it is worth it. Uh, when you're all done, you get this just amazing, um, unique grain <clears throat> that <clears throat> is uh, supposedly more nutritious than any of our other cultivated grains, like wheat or barley or oats or something like that. It's just a really, it's really, really good for you. Um, food. You do need to get a, a Permit. I haven't checked recently. Last time I checked, the permits were $15 and it allowed you to um, harvest wild rice, which is usually done around the end of August, early September. You gotta have your timing just right. If you get out there too early, the, the, the seed heads won't knock off the plants into your canoe. That's basically how it's done. The picture of these two gentlemen on the upper right, uh, one person is pushing with a long pole through a thick bed of rice the other person has a pair of knockers, these um, usually cedar sticks that they use to bend the plant over the canoe. They gently stroke it with the other knocker and that knocks off the grains into the canoe. And uh, before long, the person doing that is um, oftentimes waist deep in, in uh, green wild rice uh, as it accumulates in the bottom of the canoe. But a great, Great storing food. This was definitely a staple of the Ojibwa. Um, they they farmed up farmed. They still farm up here as well. But the the grain was easy to transport, easy to store. They could leave caches of it around um, and uh, utilize it all year. Amaranth is another plant we have around here. Um, gardeners struggle with it a little bit, but the seeds are edible. Uh, catch the seeds at just, at just the right time. And as you can see, you can sort of um, ruffle the seed heads and the seeds come dropping off um, into a bowl and they can be eaten, um, eaten or baked with that way. Now we get away from plants and we're more into meat. Uh, if we're talking about foraging and wild edibles um, up here in the North Shore, we definitely need to be talking about meat, uh, venison, um, uh, moose, um, back even before the logging era, there were a lot of caribou up here. Uh, very important source of protein and nutrition for, for people and um, still 
culturally in Minnesota and a lot of other states is still a very relevant um, way to, to harvest your own wild grown um, uh, low fat meat. Of course, fishing, whether it be winter or summer, uh, the top picture there shows something that I have eaten in Europe, um, in England, they call it white bait. And it's just different species of minnows. They literally deep fry them whole as they are and you eat them. They're delicious. And there's no reason why, you know, if you're, if you're starving, if you're looking for protein, if you're looking for something to eat and you're not catching that three pound northern, um, you, you could be eating the bait that you're using to try to catch the northerns with. Um, just try to expand your expand your uh, repertoire of, uh, of of fish a little bit. Think a little bit smaller, and those are very edible. Uh, crayfish um, are a good kind of fun uh, food to harvest up here. Um, unfortunately and unfortunately, it's kind of both sides of the coin. They um, there are invasive rusty crayfish in a number of lakes up here. And you can look it up online and find out where the rusty crayfish are. They outcompete all the other native crayfish species and may or may not have an impact on wild rice beds in those lakes. They've been, they're being studied by the, uh, the 1854 Band of Ojibwa and the DNR and Lake County Shore and Water Conservation just to see what sort of impacts they have on lakes. So this is a really a guilt-free sort of source of protein because they are an invasive species. And um, I've just modified some minnow traps to have a little bit bigger hole, put a, um, a fish head or fish guts in there from fishing I have done earlier in the year and let them sit overnight. And with 10 of those traps, I can harvest a half a five gallon bucket of these large crayfish overnight. Um, it really, really kind of, fun um, social activity to just sit around a table full of these and crack the tails and, and, and eat the meat out of them. Of course, there are upland game birds that, that can be utilized as food up in the North Shore. Um, spruce grouse, rough grouse, um, and frankly, other birds as well, but um, tend to focus on the game birds. Whoever thought of eating the American beaver, um, I have done so. Um, it's it's kind of tough. It, it is flavorful, um, and apparently the beaver tail is quite um, quite the delicacy. I've never eaten beaver tail before, but just a short little note or anecdote: the um, French voyageurs tried to lobby the Pope to let them eat beaver tail during Lent because it's scaly like a fish, so it must be a fish, and they were turned down. But beaver tail is, is supposed to be quite tasty. And we got mushrooms, of course, the morels in the spring. There are chanterelles in the middle of the summer. There's several different kinds of chanterelles. Um, mushroom foraging is a very popular thing. People get really excited about it. But I, I just want to double down on the fact that there are quite a number of mushrooms out there that will make you regret that you've eaten them in one way or the other. Um, there are some that are deadly, but there are many that will just make you really sick for a while. And so getting to know your mushrooms, if you're going to be a mushroom hunter, um, is quite important. Uh, but the chanterelle up here on the North Shore is sort of the, the most sought after um, type of mushroom. Uh, they're just, they're delicious. Uh, the picture on the right is just one small foraging trip that I took, and I dehydrate them, and we, we use them all year. Puffballs, there's different types of puffballs. Uh, the one to be concerned about, there's a type of mushroom that looks like a puffball called an earth star, which you need to avoid. That's very toxic. Uh, but there's lots of different kinds of puffballs, from the giant puffballs down to pear-shaped puffballs and reticulated puffballs. Um, they have a unique taste that I, I'm not very fond of, but I do have some friends that just love eating puffballs. Lots of different kinds of oyster mushrooms, uh, usually growing off of dead or dying wood. Um, uh, very tasty. You want to try to get them when they're pretty fresh because they get infested with beetles pretty quickly. 
um, and you don't want to compete with beetles for your supper. The lobster mushroom is an interesting one. It's actually a parasite. It's a fungus that parasitizes a host species, the white russula or two other species, and it creates this, this monstrosity of a blaze orange thing um, that comes pushing up out of the dirt. They're always quite dirty and need some cleanup to do on them. Um, and they do taste like seafood. Um, it's best to start with a small batch of them first so that uh, there, there are some people that are sensitive to some of the lobster mushrooms if they come from a, one host species versus another. Um, and so take it slow, um, try a little bit of it, see if it, see if it works out for you, but um, they dehydrate really well. And sometimes there's been days when I found 20 or 30 pounds of them in one spot. Lots of different bolete species, not all of them are edible, um, but the king bolete, um, also known as the porcini mushroom, grows wild up here in, in pretty good numbers. And you got the chicken of the woods, uh, grows on dead trees, uh, really hard to mistake it for anything else. There's just nothing else out there that looks, looks like this. This one's a pretty safe one, uh, but again, do your research. It has the texture and kind of the flavor of chicken thus chicken of the woods. So that was a pretty quick run through and I'm just wondering if I've missed anything, if there's if there's questions out there or if there's um, um, someone who has more suggestions for me. Great, that was a lot of information. I did put a link to Teddy Gooch State Park in the chat. So if people want to check that out, they can um, Click on that and check out the park and some of the events you have coming up. And if anybody does have any questions or suggestions for Kurt, please put them in the in the Q and A there. Um, Brittany put a comment in there that she found and tasted her first pheasant back mushroom over Memorial Day, and it was absolutely delicious. So that's another good one. Yep. Um, pin cherries and plums. Do you guys uh, find them up yeah, there? We do have pin cherries around. Pin cherries are really closely related to choke cherries. Taste a lot like choke cherries, but and they grow kind of singly on on a on a shrub instead of in those sort of grape-like clusters. And I find the harvesting pin cherries um, just because they typically ripen at the same time as same, same time as choke cherries that I. I don't eat a lot of pin cherries just because choke cherries are so much easier to harvest. You can just get buckets full of them in no time. Uh, but pin cherries are good. What was the other one again, Benji? Um, plums. Plums. There are some wild plums up here. There, there's not a lot of wild plums up on the North Shore. Um, but I, I, I have a few stands that I have visited in the past. And uh, they're delicious. So the, the American wild plum is just really, really tasty. Lots you can do with it. And I'd just like to remind everybody too, if you can use the Q&A, that helps me out being able to track some of these questions. So getting quite a few in the chat, but uh, Jill did ask in the in the chat, I will still get to your question, Jill, because I happen to be in the chat right now. Hazelnuts, do you harvest those when they're green or do you wait until they turn brown to harvest them? The outer husk, that husk that's got the, the kind of spiny hairs on it will be green when you harvest them. So if you're interested in harvesting uh, hazelnuts, you kind of got to be in an area for a little while or get lucky. And what I've done in the past is just put on a pair of gloves, go out, find some hazel, peel back that, um, peel back that green husk and look for the, the, the nut inside will be white if it's not ripened and it will be dark brown if it is ripe. Great. And the husk on the outside stays green while, while it's, while it's ripening. Okay. I really like the nettles thing. My my girls actually took a class and they were picking nettles and made some nettle tea for us and like lemonade type stuff. And they said they're, it's actually pretty easy to pick just with bare hands if you touch, I think, the leaves on the top and the bottom, but don't touch edges. Is that correct? Um, that That's not been my experience. Um, okay. Top and bottom also have their little sil silicone, silica, um, needles they're actually little needles that that have an irritant in them um i uh, my wife just typically uses a pair of gloves and um 
and just harvesters on that harvests them that way when you cook them or steam them or or do something with them that that um the the itchiness factor goes away it just kind of melts away yeah. it's kind of interesting i never tried to pick them before and they said oh yeah you can do it just like this and i was like whoa well kind of cool it tasted good I, though so i'll have to try it out <laughs> um gil has asked about um concern for eating cattails for you know with the pollen and allergy sufferers sufferers is that a concern or um that's probably a good thing to think about if 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 you know you're sensitive to um cattail pollen that might be one to avoid um as far as other hay fever and other pollen based um allergies i'm not i'm not sure how that affects the actual just consumption of the pollen itself Me, an interesting experiment yeah yes <laughs> now what about eating some of the invasives like garlic mustard dames rocket and the like well, luckily we don't have either of those on the north shore in any numbers that i know of but garlic mustard um friends of mine that live farther south in the state um besides having a fierce hatred for them, for that plant, because it's invasive and it takes over things, um, also have this sort of um, diametrically opposed love of them because there's, they're quite tasty. Uh, you can do a lot, you can do a lot with them. And I've heard of people making garlic, garlic mustard um, pesto before. No, oh. just be careful picking them, right? Yeah. Diane, a great question here. Is foraging allowed in Minnesota State Parks? Is it free to come in and forage? I'm glad you brought that up. Okay, so here are the rules in Minnesota State Parks. You can harvest for personal use the fruiting bodies of plants and things like that. So uh, a raspberry is a fruiting body. You can eat the raspberry. You cannot harvest the leaves from state parks, though. So you can't harvest the plant itself, just the fruit. Um, so fiddleheads, that's another one. Fiddleheads, are, you cannot um, legally harvest those in Minnesota State Parks because that's taking the plant. That's taking the part of the plant. Uh, mushrooms are really the fruiting body of this amazing network of fungal growth of mycelium underground. Um, and so mushrooms are pickable as well. Nuts are pickable in state parks as well, the fruiting bodies. So that's that's kind of the clarification is, is it a fruiting body? If yes, you can harvest it for personal use. It's great to know. Otherwise, you have to find some other land or public land to, to harvest from. Good. Yeah. Thanks for explaining that. So, And that brings up, uh, Mark was asking if you have any great suggestions or an online guide to ID some Minnesota edibles. I'm sure there's a hundred of them out there, but I don't know if you have one. You know, every, everybody does everything on their phone now, so right. I don't know if you. I have don't, one I don't have any or... sites that I know of right now. I don't. I don't know. I, I would, uh, if I was trying to find a good site, I would be doing some searching online, and then um, um, I would want to make sure that whoever's writing this blog or post or website um, is it is encouraging ethical harvesting of things like leeks, um, um, safety when it comes to different berries or mushrooms, that kind of stuff. So I, I would use that as sort of a weeding out tool um, to just, to, just to make sure that I've got a good source. There's, you know, I've, I've been up to Teddy Gooch and a lot of the state parks and there's some great books on all kinds of plants and animals in the state parks too. So yep, I encourage are. you to walk in the visitor center and check those out too. So uh, Lena asked the same question. Um, are there dual berries? I'm not familiar with that one. Spell it for me, please. Uh, CL, oh, cloud berries it is. Oh, cloud berries. I, I need to put my glasses on. Uh, cloud berries, I've actually eaten cloud berries in Sweden. Um, when they're when they're ripe there, they do grow there. There apparently are a population or two of cloudberries in Minnesota. They're 
Um, their locations are kept very secret because it's such a rare plant here. I don't even know where they grow. And from what I've heard, all we have in Minnesota growing, we have, there are stands of cloudberries. They grow in bogs and things like that, uh, wet areas. Um, but there are large stands of cloudberries, but they're all male plants. They're reproducing vegetatively and not producing any fruit at all. Hmm. It's interesting. Yeah. Um, black walnuts. Do you guys have black walnuts along the North Shore? Don't have them along the North Shore. They're um, they're more of a zone four or even even higher um, as far as gardening kind of goes. Um, I, I have tried planting them here at my place just kind of for fun, and they grow for a couple of years and then they die. Uh, so we don't have a lot of black walnuts, but statewide black walnuts. Uh, I would take black walnuts over English walnuts any day. They just have such an amazing flavor. There are a lot of work to get the meat out of them, but um, but it's worth the effort. They're very tasty. Oh, is it a couple more come in there? Um, one person mentioned water crest. That's a great thing. I know that's pretty yep. frequent down here in our trout streams. I'm yep. sure you get some up there too. Yep, we get a little water crest as well, yep. That's a good one. Um, several questions about um, upcoming courses on foraging, um, other books on foraging. Somebody did throw in their, their uh, Samuel Thayer's book and Alan Bergano's Forager Chef as great resources. I'm not familiar with either of those books off the top of my head. I've seen the Voyager Chef one, but I haven't I haven't looked at it. But it's uh, yeah, there's there's plenty of reading material out there. And we did talk a little bit before the program started about upcoming courses. And it's, you know, like you were saying, it's really hard to predict when you're scheduling stuff in advance, what's going to be coming up. So most, I know you don't, I don't know if any other parks do run too many foraging classes because of that. Yeah, I haven't heard of too many other foraging um, programs at Minnesota State Parks. It's just, it's such a tough thing because you need to schedule these things in advance and you don't know when things are going to ripen and this is a classic year for it or we're up here in the north shore we're as much as two to three weeks behind on just about everything this year um, um as far as emerging and blooming and and all that kind of stuff and so this would have been a terrible year to try to try to predict when when things were getting ripe. so it's 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 all about just kind of observation and um, taking the time to look around and seeing seeing what's ripe and what isn't. But um, it's really hard to um, do an actual active let's go out in the woods and forage kind of program because what's ripe, what's pickable right now, that kind of thing. Yeah, it, it encourage you have to encourage people to get out more often and experience more often, and a lot of these things are. You got to get the timing just right. So if you're a week off, you're going to have to come back. So. And, if, and if you're into phenology at all, or the sort of the science of the observation of when things in nature occur, um, that's a great help for you. If you if you uh, mm -hmm. are a phenologist and keep keep kind of a you know regular notes on when when things are happening, you can plan ahead and and get closer to those dates. Um, with some year-to-year -year observations. That's a great idea. So, uh, Mary is asking, you touched a little bit on cut cattail pollen, and she was wondering if you have what uses what uses you have for cattail pollen. What do you use it for? I've, I've actually not gone to the effort of collecting cattail pollen myself. Um, I have eaten it in pancakes, though, before, just sort of mixed in as kind of a flower, uh, an addition to the flower, in pancakes um I, I think it would be really good as, as a like a thickener and in, in a, a stew or something like that okay uh summer was wondering do you forage for any other uses besides substance like jewel weed for salve etc thanks yeah that's kind of my wife my wife is sort of the uh um what am i trying to say she she she's kind of the herbalist um, and so she's keeping an eye on um, when dandelion roots are best to pick for a certain use. And she's making tinctures and making salves and making 
NFTs and things like that. So there's, I, I didn't, I really was just discussing here about wild edibles, but there's a completely whole separate field of the medicinal uses for all these plants. And there's a lot of, a lot of knowledge out there. Um, thankfully we haven't lost all of it, uh, but there are some good books out there. There's, ah, I can't remember the title of the book, but it's, it's an Ojibwa based book on um, uh, medicinal uses of northern plants. Great. But I can't remember That'd be a good one to look up. Yeah. So, um, are there any wild lingonberries in Minnesota? <sighs> um, I think so. I don't know for sure. I know people. I know people that raise them in their gardens. Um, I think we've had, I think we have lingonberries here. I've looked for them. I've seen plants that look like them and I found out that they're not the right plant. Um, but I think there may be some lingonberries that a good, a good place to look on that would be to go to iNaturalist and just search for the lingonberry. And, and if, if uh, citizen volunteers who contribute to this online website have found them, they'll show up on that map. Naturals, that's a fun little app too. So you get that's lots a, of information on there. It's an addicting app, yeah. <laughs> Corey's wondering blackberries or black raspberries? Is there a difference? Uh, there's two different things. Um, up here on the North Shore, we have a few blackberries that grow. I actually have one little clump of blackberry brambles on my property. Um, they produce kind of a small, dry berry. It's edible, it's not delicious. Um, and um, I haven't propagated them just because they are about the thorniest thing I've ever met. Um, black raspberries don't naturally grow up here, but um, they can be planted up here to be to be utilized. I just actually planted my first black raspberries from farther south uh, just last summer, and I'm anticipating, oh, in about 10 years, I'll probably get a good crop of black raspberries because that's I grew up eating black raspberries, and that's one of my favorite, favorite fruits. Great. Uh, Jesse was wondering about how invasive is lamb's quarters if she wants to plant some in the mulch. Will it take over in a similar fashion to chives or raspberries? Um, possibly. It's it's a pretty aggressive grower. Um, I, I fight it in my garden and I leave little patches of it here and there to harvest from, but I am fighting it quite a bit in my gardens. I think it's pretty invasive. Um. Blueberries, when do they typically ripen? Kathy was wondering. Uh, um, it's usually early to mid July. And I was just up on Palisade Head the other day and those plants there are blooming like crazy right now. Um, so it's, it's looking like our spring weather conditions were conducive to a good blueberry crop. So I am, um, Unofficially predicting this year, unless something happens, is going to be a pretty good blueberry year up on the North Shore. Good to know. You know it's one of my favorite things in the Barney Waters is to find some good blueberry patches to add to my pancakes in the morning. So. Yeah. Pa Palisade Head, the top of Palisade Head is a pretty popular place to pick blueberries. Um, there's a parking lot right up on top. You can drive right up on top, park there. Um, if I was picking blueberries, I would take at least a five minute walk in either direction. Uh, in any direction except off the edge of the cliff, um, just to get away <laughs> from where the crowds have been to find more blueberries. But there's there are, there's a lot of blueberries on top of Palisade Head. It's good to know. We were talking about climbing, rock climbing on Palisade Head a little bit earlier, so yeah. it's be one of my favorite places to go along with Teddy Gooch. But um, we get a couple of comments on posting these webinars online. We do post them. I will put a link into the chat shortly on our website. They are recorded, like we said, so they will be posted there. Come back and watch them, share them with your friends, whatever you want to do, that would be great. Um, Dawn was asking about a list or picture guide of what, it ed what is edible and what is poisonous. I think we touched on that pretty well. Um, we don't have any strong rec recommendations there, but there are several books um, I naturalist. There's several guides out there do a little sleuthing and digging yeah, find just one that's a, good for you just a little note on that i grew up i grew up with the with the i'm going to put in air quotes the truth that um all purple berries are edible all some red berries are edible and no white berries are edible 
Um, so the whole white berry thing, think of poison ivy, they have white berries on them. White berries are, are poisonous. I, I don't know of any exceptions to that. There may be some. Um, some red berries can be uh, poisonous or problematic for some people. Um, and then the idea that all blue or purple berries are edible isn't true either. Uh, the buckthorn, European buckthorn, is um, a good example of a of, of, of purple or blueberry that humans just can't eat. Good, good point out. Thank you. Uh, Mark was wondering if you have any good advice on preserving raspberries. He's tried to freeze. She's tried freezing them and resulting in flavor change and texture that wasn't very appealing to him. Anybody uh, suggestions? So we, we freeze a lot of raspberries, but I'm I'm also a I'm a big jam fan. I make a lot of jams every year. Um, but I've I've had pretty good success freezing them myself. Uh, try to get as much air out of them as you can, just so they don't freeze or burn quite so much. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm sorry to hear that hasn't been a good experience for her. And uh, James put something in the chat about uh, milkweed pods, a good substitute for jewelweed flowers. Or... Yeah, I've never I've never eaten um, milkweed pods. Uh, there's not a lot of milkweed on the North Shore. Um, I'm trying to get more of it just for monarchs, but there's not a lot of milkweed growing up here right now. And then the jewelweed, that's another one that <clears throat> those have. Um, uh, after they flower, they put a seed pod on that's soft. And when if you touch them when they're just perfectly ripe, they, they sort of do this little mini explosion in your hand and you end up with four or five seeds in your hand. And those seeds taste just like black walnuts. They're just really delicious. Hmm. I've never tried that. I've always used it for mosquito bites. Yep. Eat. And for snow burns too. Yep. Yep. Uh, and Mary, Put in the chat here that Minnesota wildflowers, they list lingonberries as native and found in Northeast Minnesota. So they must be around. Excellent. That's good to hear. And I'm, 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 I'm going to probably start seeking them out. I lived in Sweden for a year and you could just walk out anywhere and just graze on lingonberries anywhere. So it'd be really fun to find them here. I tend to find them at the Ikea store. It's one of my favorite syrups to add to my pancakes. Exactly. I never found them. Out in the wild, I guess. So maybe I'll have to come up and visit you and if you find a good patch. So I think with that, we are we are quickly running out of time here. So if anybody has any last minute questions, Kurt, we really appreciate you joining us today, sharing your knowledge about the North Shore and, and just foraging in general. Um, some great references there. So and again, My it's pleasure. all recorded. It so please share it with your friends. Um, I always like to ask at the end, Kurt, you know, next week we have a bass fishing talk coming up. That's going to be great. Fishing is always a popular topic with us. So I encourage people to join in next week to the Moss program next Wednesday at noon, talking bass fishing. But this weekend, it looks like it's going to be a great weekend. We just got over kind of the hot spell. You guys didn't get it too much up north. But um, if people want to head out this weekend and come up north and look for something um, foraging wise, what could they find up there? What's something that might be blooming now that be a good, uh, good thing to come look for this weekend? This is sort of an awkward time of the year. Um, berries aren't ripe yet. Um, the chanterelle mushrooms haven't come up yet. Morel mushrooms are rare up here and they're probably done already. Um, so things like cattail tubers, um, I don't know what stage the cattails are at, but they're blooming right now, but maybe pollen collection. Something like that. Um, uh, fishing, of course, um, would be a good way to forage. But um, late late June is kind of a tough time to find stuff. It's July and August is when where is when the fun really begins. Great. So a good time to come up and research places for later in the year too. So that's right. So again, thank you everybody for attending. Um, Kurt, thank you for joining us. I encourage everybody to get out this weekend. Explore some of the state parks if you're not able to get up north. We have several of them down here in the uh, metro area and south also. So get out and explore them and 
talk to the naturalists there. They're a wealth of knowledge and they're more than happy to share that with you. So I think with that, we'll stop the recording and we'll go back to the back room and thanks everybody. Hopefully we'll see you next week. Yeah, thank you all.